Holy Ghost down there and did just exactly that. I didn't put in a word for her. I work next door to Chick-fil-A corporate. My insurance office is right next to what they call the Roost, which is the corporate ownership for that area. And it was a couple of days had gone by. She told me she'd gone down there to see him. And the fellow that owns the, uh, the franchises in our area, I came by my office one day and he said, I want you to know your daughter came by the other day. And I said, she was there looking for a job. And said, I was in the back. And he said, I saw her standing out front. And he said, I wonder if that's Brother Toby's daughter. He said, I noticed her standing out there. Said, she stood out. This is the words he used. He said, there she was, fully dressed. I said, I sure do hope so, David. Or else she's going to get in some serious trouble when she gets home. If she went to Chick-fil-A without being fully dressed, she's getting in trouble. Amen. He said, well, what I mean by that is she didn't have on her pajamas or she wasn't all, you know, slobbed around with a ball hat on and looked like a cat that's licked its paw and tried to mash its hair down on top of its head. And she came in fully dressed. And we're in a time and a day where people are so careless with themselves and seem like it just doesn't matter. But we ought to present ourselves as a matter of modesty and to do our, do our best to communicate with one another modestly. I'm amazed by the things people say to one another and how they behave. And it is a stumbling block to many. So many of this thing is a sin of the flesh. And for some, this thing is a sin of the mind. It's the sinful working of the mind. It's evil thinking, mistrust, a judgmental spirit, a critical spirit, covetousness, rebellion, which God says is as evil as witchcraft. And all of these are sins of the mind. It is that stinking thinking. That's what's happening in many of people's lives. Stinking thinking. And we need to clean our minds out. Romans 12 tells us I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your body as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God if you're going to live for God you'll need a renewed mind our minds have been stained with the things of this world and my friend we cannot walk and talk, talk and think and act I like the world does and walk really with God fallen man does not think right and save men need the help of God to help us think right while we are in the flesh Romans chapter 8 verse 6 says for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is at enmity with God my friend hey hey thank God it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Oh, well, my friend, your mind needs to be renewed. I was telling my wife this afternoon what I was going to preach on tonight. She said, you mean this is the second service that you're there and you're going to preach like that to them? She said, they'll be scared to death, pass out or walk out. I told her that wouldn't be the first time I'd seen any of those things happen. And I, my friend, did not come. At three and a half hours across the state of Alabama, nearly into Mississippi, wherever it is that I am here tonight, I had to try to tell you what you want to hear. I came to confront you with what saith the word of the Lord and that there is an answer there is help if you get your mind on the things of God and my friend set your affection on things above and not on things here below you can't spend all day day and night dwelling on and thinking about worldly things and ungodly things and wicked things and expect to be spiritual in your walk Philippians chapter 4 verse number 6 be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally brethren whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are honest whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are of good report if they're 
be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Are those the things that have occupied your mind today? Is that what has filled your spirit and your soul? Have you been singing about the blessings of God? Thinking about the goodness of God? Or have you been dwelling in some malice towards somebody you're upset with? Thinking about somebody who's done you wrong? And how much you'd like to shake them to the brain rattles? Oh, my friend, is there something in your heart has some animosity or some jealousy has some bitterness that's just spilling over or has stirring up on you if you dwell on those things I'm not afraid it'll make you sour and mean and difficult but if you dwell on the good things dwell on the godly things I think on these things God will help you this evening there are the sins of the flesh, there are the sins of the mind, and there are the sins of the heart. When that thing plagues you in the heart, it's most likely to be the thing that is hidden. But it is, my friend, just as deadly as a bottle of liquor or a pill bottle, friend. That is the sins like jealousy and malice and hatred and strife and bitterness and pride, which God says will go before destruction. This is lust, it is greed or the love of money, which is the root of all evil. It is selfishness and anger and vengeance. It is that thing in your life. I'm really not preaching the sermon yet. I'm just kind of trying to lay the groundwork. But I'm telling you, we're eating up with that thing. But he was a leper, the Bible says. Tonight, if you're not real careful, if you've heard what I've preached so far and turned me off at this point, you'll think I'm the only one that deals with that. You'll despair and you'll give up. But I want to remind you of something. Not only does this preacher deal with it and that preacher deal with it. And everybody on those pews around you deal with something in their lives like that. All of your Bible heroes did as well. Every one of them did, friend. Uh, even those of the greatest renown were not exempt from dealing with that thing. Uh, Satan will tell you because that thing's in your life. You're no good for anything and God will never use you and you may as well give up. But you got to remember, friend, he's bad to lie. Uh, my friend, he's a liar and the father of it. Uh, and my friend, even the greatest heroes of the Bible, uh, my friend, the word records these things for our learning that we may know how to get to victory name and found that it took a miracle of God and the Lord's mercy to wash away the scourge of that thing from his life but seven times down in the muddy Jordan River he came up and that thing had been removed by a miracle of the Lord he had turned from his pride and his self-sufficiency and acted by faith on what the Lord had given him and my friend God took away that thing Isaiah is maybe the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, but he had a dirty mouth, and he was not alone. The Bible says in Isaiah 6 and 5, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. And my friend in the Bible said he had to have help. He may be the most prominent prophet in the Old Testament literature. He prophesied more about the first and second coming of Christ than any other. He told us more about the millennial he'll reign than any other prophet and he was five chapters into his prophecy before he got the victory over his unclean lips amen matter of fact while he railed on everybody else for how sinful they were in chapters one two three four and five he had a dirty mouth amen did not discount anything he preached from chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. It was all thus saith the word of the Lord. But he came to the place when he saw the Lord high and lifted up. He realized it ain't my brother and it's not my sister and it's not the whole country. It's me, oh Lord, standing in need of prayer. He needed help. Oh, would you realize that tonight? Would you not look across the pew and say, Boy, I know Brother Toby's really preaching Brother so-and-so. Man, he's got that thing in his life. He needs to get straight now. Let him have it. I've had him come by the door and say, You really preached a thing? I missed the aim then I'm not aiming to preach to them I'm aiming to preach to you I'm trying to confront you tonight with who you are where you stand and how terribly you need God in your life Amen Job, who was the greatest man in all of the East, God called him that. He had been perfect and upright before the Lord, but his pride stopped him from praying for his friends. He maintained his integrity through all of his trials, but he could not get ultimately 
victory over his calamities until he humbled himself in Job 42 and 10 and he prayed for his friends who had accused him wrongly and God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. If a man like Job could have a problem to deal with then you and I are definitely not anywhere above it. Simon Peter was double-minded. He was like a reed shaken in the wind. One moment he was willing to fight and die. The next he was denying Christ three times, cursing and swearing and never knew the Lord. That thing in his life was inconsistency. Even after he became a preacher at Pentecost, even after he saw the sheet of the heaven from heaven in the vision, even after he preached to the Gentiles at Cornelius' house, Paul had to oppose him to his face for his inconsistency in standing up for Christ and the gospel to save those of the Jews did not like that thing was always a battle to him that double minded man let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord Simon Peter was double minded Samson lost his life to lust he was spirit filled he was mighty and he was respected but his eye for women led him to break his vows to God oh he's not the first person that's happened to his eye for women led him to break his vows to God oh that thing left him blind and bound and a boy leading him about as a child and they poked his eyes out with a hot poker and they put him to grinding at the meal like an ox that thing my friend destroyed him he finally got victory over that thing but it was not until his dying day and that thing still caused him to die with his enemies that day David the king a man after God's own heart paid fourfold the price of that thing in his life he was a man after God's own heart he's the sweet singer of Israel he wrote more than 50 of the Psalms in the Bible he's the first David is the first human name mentioned in the New Testament and is the last human name in the New Testament and Jesus was called the son of David but God brought that thing that David had done my friend out into the open his verdict he spelled out for others was that they would pay fourfold for what they had done and God said the man will pay but David thou art the man my friend he became the song of the drunkards adultery and murder were exposed in his life and David and Bathsheba wallowed in their sin and the whole nation was plunged into disarray while their baby lay dying in that place. Jacob, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, he was a deceiver. He was a liar. He had trouble with the truth. It would be hard to make any argument that Jacob was a better man than Esau for most of their lives. Jacob was a deceiver and it almost destroyed him. He fought that thing. He ran from that thing. He was ashamed of that thing in his life. But he finally faced it at the river Jabbok where he wrestled with a man all night long. And it was the Lord he was wrestling with. It was my friend dealing with who he was in the face of God that had caused him to fight and finally my friend as day broke he cried out to God I will not let you go until you bless me and God blessed him and he changed him and he said you'll no longer be called Jacob a deceiver but you'll be called Israel a prince God had to give him deliverance and victory over that thing Joshua, not Joshua the, uh, the follower of Moses, but Joshua the high priest uh, in the days of Haggai and Zechariah was filthy before God. Uh, but God took away his filthy garments uh, and his clothes and he gave him clean garments to wear. You can get victory from God over that thing. If you don't wait too late, you can get victory, friend. Let me mention one more thing and I'm beginning to close tonight. That thing in biblical disasters. In every case where that thing became destructive and a disaster in the Bible, it's because people waited too late to deal with it. The Lord will help you, but you can't wait too long to seek His help. One man said that most prodigals do come back home, but the shame is that many of them don't live long enough. 
Don't wait too long. Don't wait until that thing catches up with you, overcomes you, destroys you. You will either get victory over that thing in your life or it'll get victory over you. You'll either get rid of it or it will get rid of you. I've dwelt so much today on my friend in South Atlanta. I would have made a list of people for you in churches that I preached in, a long list of people that I would have thought that would have been before it would have been him. His church was devastated. That thing, you'll either get rid of it or it will get rid of you. You'll never know the fullness that God intends for you with that thing in your life. You'll only live on the offspring of others like our missionary family that I mentioned in the beginning of the message. Revelation chapter 2 tells of a disaster because of this. Revelation 2 and 20, Notwithstanding I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And this is what God says about that woman and those that followed her. And I gave her space to repent of her fornications, and she repented not. She had opportunity, but she delayed. She waited too long. He said, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that committed adultery adultery into her into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds he gave her opportunity to repent but she waited too long those who were following her ways had the opportunity to repent as well but it won't last forever friend and you're here alive and breathing and hearing the message today and now's the time to repent of your sin and get it right before it's too late I think about Achan he was a soldier of the Lord we preach about Achan as if he were always a man stealing Babylonian garments, wedges of gold and silver, always a no-count rascal. But he was a soldier of the Lord. He was a soldier in the Lord's army. He was doing the will of God, going to battle when he was supposed to. But he took of the accursed saying, and instead of owning up to it and admitting to it, friend, this man of war who God had brought out of Egypt across the Red Sea saw the Lord work miracles in the wilderness, and my friend, that thing came in his life and he took the accursed thing from Jericho and his sin brought death to him and to Israel and to him and to his family at Ai, a stoning to his whole family. He wept, the Bible said, and repented. And my friend was filled with remorse afterward, but it was too late to deal with that thing before that thing dealt with him. Esau cried with a bitter cry. But the Bible said he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears, according to Hebrews 12 and 17. He sinned, he played the fool, he despised his birthright, but God rejected him and repented too late for victory. Judas Iscariot's maybe the best illustration from the Bible about this. When Jesus gives sight to the blind and makes the lame legs to walk, calls the dead from the ground. Judas is there. Sees all of it with his eyes. And yet, Satan entered into Judas. And he sold the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. He betrayed him with a kiss. I would love to travel across the world. I've thought about it several times, come very close several times, and always get to be a scaredy cat right about the time it comes time to go. Some pizza parlor somewhere or another get it blown up by somebody, and they start having some political unrest and start shooting people and some terrorist activity or something. I decide I don't think I want to get on that plane and fly over to the Holy Land. I would love to go and see the land where Jesus walked. I'd love to see the shores of Galilee. I would love to go into that garden of Gethsemane where he prayed under stress from Satan and he prayed until his, his sweat was as great drops of blood and yet my friend here I am a half a world away thinking what an opportunity it would be just to see the place where Jesus walked and Judas stood there with him while he walked and while he talked and while he preached and while he worked miracles and walked into that garden where Jesus was praying and where the sweat was upon his face mingled with blood, uh, walked up to the darling Lamb of God, kissed the blood on his face uh, and my friend kissed the gate of heaven and went to hell. Walked 
walked with the Lord Jesus, regretted his deeds, went back to the high priest, said, I have a betrayed innocent blood. They said, see thou to that. It's your problem, not ours. Oh, my friend, he waited too late to repent. And he ran out and he hanged himself. And the Bible said his bowels burst open and gushed upon the ground. That thing was too much for him and he waited too late to deal with it. Tonight, that thing in your life, whatever it is, maybe I've called its name, maybe I've put a finger on it, but the Holy Ghost has put a finger on it in your life. Preaching like this is what has caused me trouble for 30-something years. But I'll go home tonight at peace. I'll go lay down tonight at peace with God that I've been obedient to the Lord. Some of you tonight, the Holy Spirit has put its finger, His finger on that thing in your life and pointed it out. Maybe to somebody else it wouldn't seem that great of a matter. But to you, it's eaten you up. Maybe it's your brother that you won't speak to after a relative died. It's some struggle of the inner man. That thing seems like a monster to you. You've wrestled and battled and tried to hide it, tried to overcome it in your own strength, but you feel like a failure this evening. You think you're doomed to certain defeat, but there is help in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. There is help for you in the Lord. Young minister struggling to make his way. Satan had told him he would die a failure. He's not going to make it. His family's not going to make it. You're never going to be able to survive. The ministry's going to crash and burn. You'll never make it. You can't live for God and nothing would ever become of him. He wrestled in his dreams and uh, even in the nighttime would see himself uh, and the failures that would come later in life. It seemed like it haunted him day and night. He one night went to sleep and saw himself in a dream in a house and a giant monster comes in the door and he said, I could not even describe this hideous thing that was there. It was ugly and intimidating. He said it was so loud. It was so loud and he could hardly hear anything else. And this monster in his dream that he couldn't describe was threatening and the minister, the young preacher was shrinking in fear in the house into a corner and this monster screamed at him all the things that Satan had used to try to defeat him and the young preacher tried in his dream to cry aloud against this monster but it seemed like when he screamed at the top of his voice it sounded but just a whisper he was overwhelmed with fear oh he tried to tell the monster to get out of his house that he was not welcome there but he could not be heard and finally my friend he quit talking into that monster that threatened him and began calling on God in his dream and his voice became louder and clearer and when he woke from his sleep he had been crying aloud from his dream Jesus help me Jesus help me he rolled out of the bed that night began to seek the Lord and 60 years later his ministry had proven every lie of Satan to be false of the last that I heard him preach and he got victory over that thing before he got victory over him what I'm saying to you tonight is that this is an opportunity for you to get victory tonight that Jesus can help you Jesus alone I think it's Elisha Hoffman if my memory serves right One of his church members comes to him. She's beside herself with troubles and difficulties. Worried out of her mind. Brother Hoffman, kind of like a lot of us other preachers, had kind of run out of suggestions. He had tried everything. He had told her everything he knew to do. Finally, he said, ma'am, I don't really know what else to tell you. All I know to tell you is that I can't help you. You must tell Jesus. And it was like a light bulb went off. 
She said, that's right. That's what I must do. I must tell Jesus. And he felt like such a fool. Went back to his room that night and all he could hear in his mind is, I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. And there in the depths of the dark of the night, he slipped over to his, his corner of his room and began writing on a little piece of paper, I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, tonight I would to God would sing that song. I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Everybody stand if you would please. Let's sing a song of invitation tonight. If these that sing for us and at the piano, thank you for your service and the music. I appreciate that so much. If you would please, let's sing that song in your hearing tonight. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help Would me. Would you come tonight? Jesus alone. If you need to pray you tonight, need to pray. I'd invite you to come. I'd invite you to come. Don't let anything hinder you. Don't let anything get in the way of your service to God. Don't let any secret or besetting sin stand between you and the Lord. Oh, you can get help from the Lord tonight. Let God help you as only He can. <laughs>